Hey everybody and welcome to the show. We like to call it Pancras, Legends of Mixed Martial Arts. I'm your host, Rob Wu, and sitting alongside me all season is our expert analyst, Josh, the babyface assassin Barnett. So what do we got in store this week here, uh, Rob? Well, before we go to the fights, Josh, uh, a lot of these fight fans might be wondering, what are you up to nowadays? So tell us a little bit, what are you doing? Well, I'm up to about 6'3", as per usual. I haven't gotten any shorter. And recently, I've been training a lot of uh, fighters and helping them in their fights. Uh, of course, uh, some folks are very familiar with me and Megumi Fuji, uh, and I've been helping her. She just recently had a fight in Bodog up in Vancouver. Uh, also, I've got another student, Janelle Marquez, should be fighting for a title sometime soon. So, and uh, Shayna Baszler will be hopefully competing on Showtime coming up. So, keeping very busy. And my trainer, Eric Paulson, also is coming out of retirement uh, to face Jeff Ford in an upcoming bout. He, he's so busy, and you still got time to hang out with me. Ah, lucky me, lucky me. You know, few can be so fortunate as to understand and get to know that which is the internal workings of Wu. Blood type O, which means he's a universal donor. Very kind and giving guy. But let's move on to the fights. Uh, Satoshi Hasegawa, Kim Jong Wang, our first bout. Now, Josh, uh, you know what it's like to break barriers. You're the first Caucasian male on IATV. Kim Jong Wang, the first Korean in Pancras. Yeah, uh, Wang didn't happen to have the uh, the most luck out of all, of all the Pancras fighters, as you know. Here he comes, uh, sort of a relative newcomer to the sport, and yet uh, fought a lot of very, very tough matches straight on. But here against Hasegawa, I think this is a good opportunity for Wang to make a good impression. And it is Wang's second fight. Let's see how he does. Satoshi Hasegawa versus Kim Jong Wang. And Kim Jong Wang, uh, if you, you don't know who he is, well, he's the bigger guy, a huge size advantage, Josh. He's 6'1, 238, Hasegawa, just 5'9. Yeah, Wang here is certainly the much bigger fighter, but I would expect that uh, Hasegawa is probably the more well rounded fighter out of the two of them. Both fighters back in the center of the ring. Palm strike by Hasegawa. Kim follows up with a right middle kick and a big palm strike of his own. Hasegawa diving low ankle. Uh, takedown. And as you can see right there, Josh, the uh, size di differential between both fighters staggering as we move on in the fight. Now uh, Hasegawa on top, rear mounting Kim. Looking for that sleeper and happened to catch the catch what actually looked like a face lock on Wang and Wang. Uh, Kim uh, having to take a rope escape now down to zip. And Hasegawa not letting size uh, be a factor yet, taking an early lead and Kim now working on the ankle of Hasegawa. Dropping in on that Achilles. Hasegawa attacking with the toehold instead. And this and fight is over. Wang taps out. Hasegawa, the much smaller man, but in this case, it didn't matter. Well, for Kim, this is a little bit of the, of the example of don't bring a knife to a gunfight, <laughs> with the knife being the Achilles lock and the gun being the, uh, being the toehold. So sort of trumping one hold, trumping the other. And that shows the inexperience of, of Kim, I think. Now, Hasegawa did win the fight, the ankle lock, uh, 340 in the first round, but Josh, uh, Hasegawa uh, passed away in 99, and the circumstances of his death, uh, not too clear. Yeah, uh, the way I was to understand it is that he fell off of a balcony, unfortunately. I don't know if he was intoxicated or, or just, you know, an accident, but it's very, uh, very sad uh, event indeed, and I would have liked to have seen uh, you know, how Hasegawa would have, uh, you know, developed into a fighter at this point now. All right, let's move on to our next fight. We're going to see Takafumi Ito against Osami Shibuye. Uh, what are your first impressions of these two? Both are, are uh, Ito has a little bit of an advantage of being in Pancras uh, longer than Shibuya, but Shibuya is going to have the size advantage. And like I've been pointing out uh, from the various uh, previous Shibuya matches we've seen, the guy, he's, regardless of his record, he's showing a lot of skill and a lot of talent. And Shibuya is actually one of the guys that I've kept an eye on up and all the way up until now even. All right, let's see if Shibuya could get the best of Ito. Takafumi Ito versus Osami Shibuya. And Shibuya, but his record is 5-9-2, and two, but as you say, Josh, his talent and skills uh, aren't well reflected in that record. Now here he is coming up against Ito. Uh, I want to see uh, 
Ito's recovery against that big knockout from Kunioku. Last fight we saw, still really reeling from that against uh, the, the ever-tough uh, Takahashi. And let's see if he's finally gotten over that, uh, that devastating knockout and can display some stand-up skills here against uh, Shibuya. And uh, Ito in the yellow, Shibuya in the green color. Nice double leg with an outside trip is Shibuya, putting the match on the mat and inside Ito's guard. As we move on in the fight, it looks like... Uh, Last 30 seconds here, Shibuya working a front face lock on Ito. Ito getting his head free. Last 20 seconds. Ito standing up, trying to throw some palm strikes while Shibuya is down. Right, scoring good with a nice right palm strike there the inside the guard. Last 10 seconds, I think uh, Ito is really just trying to, to show good, give a good example to the judges and maybe find a way to pull out of this match uh, with the judges' decision. And this fight will go to the judge and, ju and oh, in disgust, Ito throws his mouthpiece to the ground. Now, this match ended up in a draw, Josh. Did you see it like that? You know, I guess if you're not going to give as much credence to the strikes as you were to all the different submission attempts, I could easily see how it could be considered a draw. Uh, you know, none of those strikes were certainly anything that was going to end the fight anytime soon. And that's really what you got to look for in a fight, and especially in Pankers. It's who's looking to finish the fight most and who's being aggressive, who's really pushing to, to end the fight now, not just right out of decision or, or to make it just look good. All right, and our next fight, we're going to see Katsuomi Inagaki against Keiichiro Yamamiya. Now, Yamamiya, Josh, a fighter a lot of us haven't seen yet, but what's the scouting report on this guy? Yamamiya, he comes from a wrestling background, but happens to be a decent puncher, a southpaw, and uh, you know, a very tough, tough, grizzled fighter. Uh, mixes it up between standing and ground, but his submission game, not the most developed. All right, let's see how he fares against Inagaki. Katsuomi Inagaki versus Kaijiro Yamamiya. Fight! As we both start out, uh, Inagaki in a little bit of a slump. He's lost six of his last seven fights, so definitely looking to rebound. And Inagaki has a lot more ring experience, Josh. He's already had 23 fights. Yamamiya has only three. Hey, Yamamiya there on the right side of your screen. Uh, what seems to be, uh, well, the colors are relatively close, but it looks like in the blue trunks. Uh, I guess you can tell Yamami is the guy with the shorter hair. Yes. Inagaki has more hair now on the right side of your screen. Inagaki leading with an inside low kick. Uh, as I said before, Yamami a southpaw. Inagaki also bigger, 6 feet, 203 pounds. Yamami just 5'11 and 185. Yamamiya, early on in his career here, not showing the punching that he is uh, known for as in his later Panker spouse. But here, Yamamiya gets the takedown, Josh. A nice double leg executed by Yamamiya, getting the fight onto the ground. Both fighters still in the clinch, but nearing the ropes and a leg kick by Nagaki. Oh, yeah. And another leg kick to the face, but uh, it looks like Yamamiya managed to grab a hold of that leg and goes in for the takedown. Yeah, nice high kick by Inagaki, but really with not a lot of steam on it, was able to uh, unfortunately get reversed by Yamamiya. Still fighting it out with only seconds remaining in this bout. Both fighters should be giving it all they have, and they do. This fight is over, and the decision will go to the judges who decides Inagaki. This is the victor, and Josh uh, Yamamiya, he's maybe, uh, I didn't see what he did, but he, maybe perhaps he should have thrown more punches in there. Uh, I think just really this was a, an example of a young fighter starting out within Pancras, uh, not quite finding his groove yet, and Inagaki uh, using his experience and ring savvy to this point to uh, control most of the fight and score the more meaningful shots. Uh, sir, I don't think you can really hold it against Yamamiya, uh, losing against a veteran like Inagaki, but uh, this is a far cry from what we'll see out of Yamamiya in, in the future. All right, when we come back, one of the toughest fighters ever to step into the pancreas ring, Manabu Yamada. Welcome back to the program. Our next fight, we're going to see Manabu Yamada versus Kuma Kunioku and Josh Yamada, as we've seen previous, in previous episodes, one of the toughest guys you'll ever find in Pancras. 
Might as well just start calling him Ironhead with all the abuse <laughs> he's taking and, and kept ticking, uh, or maybe Timex, you know what I mean? But against uh, Kunioku, he has got the, got the size advantage, even though height isn't going to be really much of an issue. Yamada, quite the fire plug of a fighter, and uh, Kunioku here, he's the youngster looking to make a name for himself. All right, and Yamada finally taking on someone his own size. Let's see how he does. Kiyuma Kunioku versus Manabu Yamada. As this bout begins, uh, Kunioku in his, uh, looks like a, maybe it, it's now a trademark, the hot pink Yamada in the yellow. Both fighters about the same size, um, Yamada 5'9", Kunioku 5'8". Kunioku getting the back of Yamada, maybe looking for a tight waist takedown. And he does get the takedown. And Josh, on the mat, do you favor Kunioku over Yamada? Well, Kunioku is, is a pretty slick grappler, as you see by that nice uh, spinning arm lock attempt by Kunioku. But as you can see in Yamada's demeanor, very relaxed, very calm, collective. Uh, I really think that at this point, Yamada is the more savvy fighter all the way around. And Yamada in an interesting stance. Uh, what do you call that? Uh... You know, I'm not really too familiar with what you would call that, but it may be something that uh, is so unusual that Kunioku is a bit thrown <laughs> off by it as he eats a knee in on that takedown, gets caught in the front choke by Yamada, but wisely circles around the legs to, to escape the guard position. And I think he has escaped, and now he is on top of Yamada. Great job by Kunioku. Yeah, working the neck, getting the two-on-one, double, a double wrist ride there is Kunioku from the top, looking to insert one of his hooks. Yamada patiently waiting it out on the bottom and defending. Grabbing the headlock. Now going, yes, going for Kunioku's head. And Kunioku Kun jumping into that sleeper. Yamada needs to be careful. And he is near the ropes. He might just want to grab it or put his leg over it. The ref's asking him. He says no. We'll see if he can work his way out of this. Yamada looking none too concerned as and he Kunioku does work his relinquishes way out of this. the hold. I'm not sure why he did that, Josh. Back on their feet, Yamada lands a, a right shote, a knee, a nice left, knee. right, another right hand. Both fighters exchanging strikes. Looks like uh, Kunioku a little unsure of the striking ability uh, Yamada, against Yamada. And Yamada misses the uh, right kick and is taken down by Kunioku. And it seems to me that uh, you know, Yamada really owning the stand-up portion of this, not so much even on what he has done, but just in doubt, making Kunioku doubt his ability to really land and score clean, as every time he comes in, Yamada lands with a few shots, Kunioku then disengages. Wow. Yeah, he does land a couple shots there, though, Josh. Kunioku uh, coming in constantly, finally paying off a little bit. Yeah, Yamada just keeping his hands down, nice left high kick. Forcing Kunioku into the tackle. I think he's got the front nice choke sleeper. Nice front choke counter by Yamada. And this fight is over. Yamada wins it 8-29 in the first round. And you know what, Josh? He's not jumping around or running around like with his, like he's a chicken with his heads cut off. No jumps, no somersaults. Uh, very cool and calm guy. I, I actually find that kind of refreshing. A little understated on the side of Yamada, but uh, this fight looked a lot like uh, you know, teacher and student. And let's go on to our next fight. It's going to be Yuki Kondo against Frank Shamrock. Uh, Josh, you fought Yuki Kondo before. Frank yeah. Shamrock has his hands full. He does. And, and, while, and even still, on paper, Shamrock, it, this is an incredible opportunity for Kondo to rise up in the ranks. But also, this is a dangerous opposition of Frank Shamrock. Uh, and between the two of them, uh, they're both so dynamic and explosive, someone's either going to get knocked out or submitted in a flash. And let's see if that does happen in a flash. Yuki Kondo versus Frank Shamrock. As we start, uh, Yuki Kondo so far undefeated. He is in the blue, Frank Shamrock in the black. Frank engaging heavily, looking for the big strike right out the gate. And uh, you're right, Josh. I think he is looking for the KO in the very beginning. Both fighters exchanging blows. This fight might not last too long. Kondo, the southpaw, opens up with a nice knee. And a knee. nice knee to the face of Shamrock, but Shamrock still standing strong. 
and almost a jump kick by uh, Shamrock there, Josh. Shamrock catching that, that uh, middle kick by Kondo into the single leg, see if he can finish. Nice trip by Shamrock, puts him inside Kondo's guard on the mat. Shamrock in the full guard as he moves Kondo. And Kondo so far looking very impressive. He does not look like a guy who's had only seven fights in his career. Right, very sharp counter striking by Kondo against the aggressive sort of wild attacks coming from Frank. Right body shot by Frank. Kondo still stalking Frank Shamrock in the middle of the ring. And uh, Kondo is content to keep this fight on his feet. He is a striker and showing why unloading on Frank Shamrock. Landing big strikes, pinpoint accuracy, a nice front kick, knee and to the face. more knees. Kondo very active. Uh, Frank Shamrock's gonna have to move around a little more in the ring. He's catching a lot of blows. Now Frank needs to change his strategy and try and put this fight on the map, but uh, he's gotta keep those hands up. And Ito catches him again, turns Shamrock around for just a second. Kondo showing some swelling under the left eye from some of those powerful strikes from Frank. Big right hand of the body, followed by a left high kick by Kondo. And Kondo more kicking and palm strikes. And finally, this fight looks like it would go to a, on the ground, but Kondo uh, lets Shamrock get back up, and the referee will restart the fight in the center of the ring. Kondo tagging Frank Shamrock almost at will here. And I think we could see more knees coming here, Josh. In the clinch, locked up in a uh, collar tie-up, knee by Kondo. High kick attempted by Shamrock, nice technique. But he missed Kondo, a nice little duck at the right time. Frank showing some signs of fatigue. Kondo looking stronger, another body shot by Frank Shamrock. And Frank Shamrock, uh, I think he should look for the takedown, Josh, maybe just to catch his breath a little yeah, bit. I think he should just follow behind a, 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 a palm strike, or a, like just and nice he palm got strike. That one. Yeah, nice one, right on the chin of Kondo. But he should follow that up with a takedown eats a left and I don't know if Kondo felt that because he is just coming back on Frank takes him to the ground and this fight finally goes to the ground and I think both fighters might just want to catch their breath a little bit as we move along the fight both fighters on their feet Kondo throwing legs Shamrock and not looking to be too much on the offensive Shamrock eating lefts rights front kicks just getting the worst of these exchanges another low kick by Kondo Kondo just winding up those legs Josh Kondo getting stronger, feeling more confident on the feet as he is landing more and more and scoring more effectively against Frank. Now Frank Shamrock loves to get fired up. He could really use a dose of adrenaline right now. Kondo so far dominating the fight. Big punch from Frank, hit him mainly in the chest, but a little bit of a deflection to the Kondo's chin, I believe, was the... Uh, uh, looked, actually, punched him. Looks like he punched him right in the eye. Might have been a closed but fist punch. I believe so. Yeah. He will get a penalty. Uh, Frank Shamrock has a propensity for this. Uh, we've seen him get these uh, foul cards before. And the ref will get a towel for Kondo to wipe that blood off of his face. Well, now with this stop in action, uh, you know, let's see if he takes away from any of Kondo's momentum leading into this. And Kondo trying to pick up right where he left off. The middle kick, middle kick, and he just sake bombs Shamrock out of the ring, Josh. What a middle kick by Kondo, lands right in the head. Shamrock hits the deck outside the ring. He looks done. And that, that, and outside the mat, there is no mat. There is no mat outside the ring. So Josh, Ken Shamrock fell on some hard wood. You know, that was a, a, a very devastating combination laid in there by Yuki Kondo and uh, Frank absorbing these blows and, and instead of using head movement and, uh, and footwork, resorting to simply ducking his head, Kondo following into that, runs in with the strikes and then finishes off with, those left, with that left kick and that was all she wrote for Frank, a, a very difficult loss. And Yuki Kondo now 6-7-0-1, oh, still undefeated and Josh, he's got to have a lot of confidence Again, a win against Frank Shamrock, probably his best win yet. But I really think that this is, really shows that Funaki had a, a really good vision in picking someone like Kondo to try and follow in his footsteps. All right, we have to go to break, but when we come back, we'll see Vernon Tiger win. <laughs> Welcome back, and now we're going to see Vernon Tiger White versus Yoshiki Takahashi. Now, Josh, we've talked about this before. Uh, Vernon White, 
improving over the course of each fight. He just beat Minoru Suzuki. What a win. Coming into this fight, he's got to feel like he's got the eye of the tiger. I think uh, there's no more words to be said. Let's just go straight to the fight between Vernon White and Yoshiki Takahashi. Yoshiki Takahashi versus Vernon Tiger White. And uh, Vernon displaying the improved physique since his uh, early days in Pancras. In the black, Takahashi in the blue. Reach advantage to Vernon White, but I think the power would, and size overall weight would have to go to Takahashi with a nice lunging right, right palm strike from Vernon. I think we can just tell by the body language, Josh, that Vernon just, he looks like a different fighter. He's not the same guy. And this guy isn't some green boy rolling around the mat with his uh, trunks coming up his butt anymore. This is, a, this is a serious guy. Vernon White has 24 fights under his belt already. 7, 16, and 1 is his record. As both fighters exchange leg kicks, a nice right kick by White. Takahashi countering. White not seeming to be interested in taking this fight to the ground, and neither is Takahashi for, for that matter. Should one of these fighters be uh, looking to take this fight to the ground, though? I think if I'm Takahashi, I'd like to get, get him on his back. Nice counter strike by and Vernon Tiger White. Takahashi, uh, he is seeing stars, the ref flashing the, his hand in front of him, giving him an eight count. And he is ready to continue. But he took a real big blow. Yeah, he did. I think that was sort of a, really that came as a misjudgment of the distance between them and the reach advantage owned by Tiger Wright. And as we move along the fight, uh, these two fighters have fought once before, White Wing. And White again unleashing more shots to the face of Takahashi. He is just following Takahashi around. I think Vernon White has grown up from a cub into a real tiger. What a freaking slugfest. These guys are going at it. You know, someone has said before, you know, oh, you know, if anybody's looking at this and thinking, oh, they're slapping each other, I guarantee you get hit with one of these things and you're not going to think somebody slapped you. You're going to think you got hit upside the head with a sledge. Now this fight on the ground, Takahashi, Takahashi. with yeah, the with side the, control. With the headlock there, uh, transitioning. Uh, Vernon escaping from the back, getting mount uh, half guard position here, working against Takahashi's neck and arm. And Vernon White, uh, maybe not too comfortable in this position early on, but now with, uh, with 24 ah. fights under his belt, he, is, he knows what he's doing down there. Hey, certainly looking like a seasoned grappler here, working for the front choke against Takahashi from the top position. Uh, can apply a lot of pressure from there. If you can sink your hips down, if you can, and get that, uh, that forearm trapped underneath the chin. Takahashi got to be aware if it gets too tight that, uh, or any submission Great. attempt. That, uh, the ropes are there for him, but they're... <laughs> Saved by the rope, possibly. And uh, you did say, Josh, Takahashi wants to take this fight to the ground. But so far, Vernon White showing he's just as good on his feet as he is on the ground. Right. And I think if Takahashi does take it to the ground, he was going to want to get the top position. Whoa. Yeah, Takahashi, I'm not sure what happened there. It looks like he got hit again in the face. It was a groin shot, apparently. Oh. It was pointing to his uh, chimpo region, as they refer to it in Japanese. And uh, Vernon White, uh, I guess the referee is not going to give him a foul, incidental. If it's accidental, the ref uh, might not always give the guy the penalty. Takahashi looks like he's, uh, he's reeling from that shot. And, and even though uh, you know, incidental or not, uh, getting, getting cracked in the... In the in the groin, for lack of a better term, uh, it can really actually sap a lot of the energy out of a fighter. Right. He's got hit everywhere else in his body so far this fight. Why not? Why not let the groin get in on the action? But Takahashi uh, trying nice to work the single takedown, leg. and he does get the single leg takedown, now working on the legs of White. Beautiful single leg pick up and dump and try to transition back into the Achilles lock, but uh, unfortunately being tied so close to the ropes there was unable to get the space needed to, to get the hold. Now Takahashi should move White to the center of the ring, but I just don't know if he has enough energy left to do so. I'm actually surprised that Takahashi is going for this headlock instead of sitting up and raining down the palm strikes that he's known to do. Now, perhaps he's too tired to do so as he has uh, White's head locked. White coming out from around the back door, getting out, escaping, and attacking the neck of Takahashi, but those ropes being in the close proximity of the fighters. Sometimes the rope can be your friend, depending on uh, which fighter you are. Takahashi looking a little, a little less, uh, less excited after that nut shot. I think it, it has affected his ability to fight. 
and right there showing signs of life is Takahashi. White falls down, but it is not a knockdown. Rolling out of the way was White trying to escape those shotes from uh, from Takahashi. Takahashi getting stronger Ta from that. From Takahashi on the prowl, following White all over the ring, but oh, not a good idea. Right, a kick. Right kick. And Six, Takahashi took four, it square on the five, face, six, and the referee counting again. Eight, he will. Nine. Someone's got to tell Takahashi to keep his hands up. And Yoshiki Takahashi, I mean, he's not doing his dirty tricks, but he should consider it. And the referee trying to make sure he's okay to see if he can continue. And this fight will continue, but Takahashi still having those up. And he needs to keep his hands up. It's still a little low. Yeah, being very immobile like that, standing right in front of Vernon, has, has not done any favors for Takahashi. If I'm Vernon White, I think I, I pour it on right now and try to get that knockout. And Takahashi, uh, I don't think he has his legs under him, which is not a good thing. His hands are down too, just his face is totally exposed to Vernon White. And another right leg kick. And Takahashi mustering up some offense, but looks... Uh, another groin shot in on accident by White. Cause a halt to this action. And uh, nothing going right with Takahashi. Uh, he can't win on his feet. He, he's not winning this fight on the ground. And another low blow by White. Uh, Takahashi... A little bit of insult to injury. Stumbling. Yes, and uh, Josh, when this happens, uh, how long does a fighter have to recover from that? Uh, usually they give them around five minutes to, to try and recover, but like I said before, even if they are able to recover and continue on to fight, sometimes this, the residuals from this really can take a lot of the energy out of a fighter. And, and uh, I've seen several instances where the fighter is able to come back, but they're not the same fighter afterwards. And uh, it might have been accidental, but since it is the second time White's done that, he gets a yellow card. Sidekick to the head by White. Interesting technique, keeping his distance. Only 30 seconds left in this match. Takahashi, if he wants to win, better score the knockout. And he is not he is coming in, but not delivering any blows. White content on letting him come in. And White, another right leg kick, and Takahashi goes wow. down the ref, calls it. This fight is over, Josh. Apparently Takahashi was hungry for some right kicks to the face. Uh, seeing as though Vernon White delivered a smorgasbord, I don't I, I think his appetite should be satiated pretty much. Uh, well, he might not eat anything tomorrow, the day after, and maybe even into... He, he might just have to go into hibernation. As we see White with the acrobatic victory. Just his third KO win, and that is a rarity for White. For White. Uh, at, at the time, yes, I, and I agree with you on that, Rob, but eventually Tiger White would go on to score the fastest knockout in King of the Cage history. And how long? I'm sure you know how long that took, right? Uh, four seconds, I believe. Wow. Against Todd Medina who we will see in Pancras. So if you want to see the guy who got knocked out in four seconds, keep watching. Now, uh, our next fight is going to be Jason DeLucia and Minoru Suzuki, and we'll see that right after the break. Welcome back, and we're going to see Minoru Suzuki versus Jason Delucia. Now, Josh, we talked about Jason Delucia being involved in the dark arts. Now, if, you know, if there's any, if there's a right time to curse somebody, it's Minoru Suzuki when you're going to fight him. Yeah, a guy as, as dangerous and as deadly as Minoru Suzuki, you could use any help you could get to pull out a win. But Delucia has been looking very, very good in his last fights, and I think he has a good chance of winning this bout. And let's see if he does win this bout. Jason DeLucia versus Minoru Suzuki. Uh, these two fighters have fought twice before, uh, Suzuki winning both times. DeLucia might be feeling lucky tonight, though. Let's see if that curse works. Inside low kick by DeLucia. DeLucia keeping his distance, knowing he's got the reach and height advantage. And Suzuki seems to be lowering his stance. Why is he doing that, Josh? Uh, I think he might be trying to bait uh, Delucia into, into, a f into throwing a strike off of what is a perceived uh, tackle attempt by Suzuki, uh, trying to set him up more like a fainting action, I believe, on Suzuki's part. Jason Delucia is 14 and 9, Suzuki 17 and 10, uh, so both fighters have plenty of ring experience. 
And Suzuki there going for the takedown and does get it. Nice double leg off of the uh, counter to Delucia's right palm strike. And as we continue the fight, both fighters back up on their feet. For not, uh, Suzuki there, excuse me, again, looking to feint and get into the tackle. Delucia charging with the palm strike, neither landing. And is that Delucia's game plan, to keep coming at uh, Suzuki and try to knock him out? I think what, he's, what Delucia's trying to do is, is look for that opening to land that strike, set him up and stun Suzuki, and then follow it up and, and get the knockdown or transition into a submission while he's dazed and recovering. But I think it's more of a timing thing for Delucia as he doesn't want to end up on his back or in a disadvantageous position against Suzuki. Uh, and as uh, Delucia is well aware, Suzuki is an incredible submission wrestler on the mat. And perhaps uh, Suzuki still trying to bait Delucia into the takedown, unable to do so. And Suzuki, it uh, looks like he wants to take this fight to the ground, but Delucia doing a good job not allowing him to do so. Absolutely. Both fighters are, are really working very... Well, nice it counter like palm strike a, by Delucia. A, well a timed. Left palm strike caught him at the right place at the right time. Josh Suzuki is down and he's trying to get up, trying to throw the ref off him, but the referee will not let him continue. Jason Delucia wins this fight via the KO. Wow, what a great opportunity for Delucia to land that strike, but I think even Delucia had no idea how effective that strike would be against Suzuki. Suzuki's got to be really disappointed. As you saw him even shove the ref away, he's got, he's just looks disgusted that he, he can't believe one strike, one significant strike lands and that's the end of the match for him. And as we see Vernon White and Jason Delucia walk off, they both train uh, with the Shamrocks and Suzuki very disappointed in himself, not happy with the way things went. Uh, but unfortunately that is fighting and at any moment, at any time, one strike can put you down and put you out and Suzuki, no needing uh, any explanation on that. And Suzuki gets some help uh, coming off the ring. now. Suzuki had beaten Jason Delucia twice before, but this time uh, Delucia got the better of him. I wouldn't say anything about this being a fluke or necessarily lucky, but Delucia has to be happy that things turned out the way he did. Every strike you throw, of course you wish you could knock somebody out, but that's not usually the case. And, and uh, this time, I don't know if necessarily the better man won, but it really worked out well in Delucia's favor this night, and you got to give him a lot of credit for seeing that opening and taking advantage of it. All right, in our next fight, we're going to see Guy Mezger versus Ryushi and Nagasawa. And, and looking at this match on paper, who's got the upper hand, Josh? Uh, Nagasawa's got size and reach, but uh, Mezger has been very successful as of late uh, in the Pankers League. And uh, the other thing about it is you've got two kickboxers really going against each other, so I think we're going to see a striking match. All right, and let's see who wins this potential striking match. Guy Metzger versus Ryushi Yanagisawa. As this fight starts off, Guy Metzger is still sporting the ponytail, and Josh, I heard you're not a fan of that. Yeah, well, you know, his personal hair choice is, is aside. Uh, Metzger is an incredible fighter. And uh, I won't hold it against him for the ponytail necessarily, but I, I tell you what, it won't be my choice. Mezger, very aggressive to start, pushes Ryushi and Nagasawa into the corner. And he let off this match with that lead leg high kick, which would become a staple of Mezger's. Nice right high kick by Mezger, but definitely blocked by Nagasawa. And Nagasawa has to keep those blocks going because Mezger has some of the best kicks in the business. And Ryushi wisely trying to take this fight to the ground, prevent uh, Mezger from using those kicks. Referee making sure uh, Mezger's got his uh, knee guard on properly. Mezger making sure his hair is in line. And uh, Nagasawa not doing much to keep that out of line, although he starts delivering a knee there. Mezger, right high kick. And it seems like uh, Nagasawa is keeping his hands a little lower than, the, than he did in the start of the fight, perhaps uh, fatigued. Yeah, both fighters seem slightly fatigued, but Mezger landing a great spinning back palm strike, throwing Yanagisawa around a little bit as Yanagisawa looks very fatigued. Nice little sprawl by Mezger, not allowing Yanagisawa to take him down. Both fighters tired, but uh, Mezger in the top position, riding Yanagisawa, taking, sapping more of that energy from him, and what little he has left. You turn over with the head. 
And it looks like Inagasawa also trying to apply a head choke. Mezger securing his side control position, looking to attack the left arm of Yuriyushi Yanagasawa. Break. Break. And the ref breaks up, and the fighters will restart in the center of the ring. That's a nice spinning kick, but Yanagasawa catches him and tries for the one-leg takedown. Didn't really get it. Yeah, tried to, dr to take that single and drop into a leg lock was Yanagisawa, but Mezger too savvy, blocking the attempt. Not much time left for Yanagisawa to possibly win this fight. And Mezger looking stronger as it keeps going and likely to win. And Mezger looks like he might have the side choke on. Ten seconds on a, on a sideways uh, locked on sleeper. Better angle from Mezger now. Yanaga and Mezger are trying to just finish this fight without it even going to the judges. Uh, I don't I don't think Yanagasawa tapped out, but uh, the judges will give Mezger the victory based on points. Yeah, the nod certainly has to go to Mezger. And Yanagasawa no noticeably exhausted as we wait for the official results to come in. Should be a uh, obvious victory for Mezger, though. And the winner is indeed Guy Mezger defeating Ryushi Yanagasawa. He improves his record to 9 3 and 2. And uh, Mezger definitely uh, broke Yanagasawa over that. 3 0 decision for Mezger in this fight. And as we bring it back, uh, we're going to get ready for our main event. It's Boss Rutan versus Masakatsu Funaki, and it's coming up after the break. Welcome back, and we are now ready for our main event. It's Boss Rutan versus Masakatsu Funaki and Josh, two heavyweights in Pancras. Both both of them have just completely left uh, everyone else in Pancras in shards. Uh, Boss Rutan, 11 straight wins. Funaki has won 10 out of, out of his last 11. Two <laughs> unstoppable force and immovable object, to use a rehash cliche, but this match is one of the greatest MMA fights of all time and considered one of the best matches within Pancras' history. I think this has fight of the year written all over it. And simply put, just sit back, get your chips, don't get up, and be amazed. All right, stay on your seats. We're going to watch it right now. Masakatsu Funaki versus Boss Ruten. As we see uh, Funaki entering the ring, and Josh, this isn't just any regular match. The King of Pankersfeld is also on the line. A lot of pressure here for Funaki, one of the founders, to finally lay claim to that belt and sit at the top of the throne as king of all the shoot fighters here in Pankers. And he's trying to take that belt away from Boss Rutan, who uh, hasn't lost many fights in any time uh, recently. 11 consecutive wins, but... Funaki, a very tough opponent. If anyone can do it, it's him. I agree with that, but and not to mention uh, the whole fact that Boss Rutan said, hey, I'm not going to lose a fight for a whole year. Or maybe I won't lose any fight for the next year, year coming in. And it's true to his word, Boss has looked unbeatable. Perhaps he should change his nickname from El Guapo to Boss Rodamus. And the crow, is Funaki the crowd favorite, Josh? Do yeah, they want him I think fight? you'd have to say that, that Funaki is the crowd favorite here. He is the face of Pancras. And uh, I think the Japanese fans would really love to see Funaki finally climb to the top of this, uh, of this mountain of, of some of the greatest fighters in the world and, and stand proudly with the belt. Both fighters uh, maybe feeling each other out a little bit as Boss throws the right kick. Very heavy inside low kick from Boss Rutan against the southpaw, Funaki. Another big right inside low kick. And looks like Funaki is being uh, very patient so far, Josh. And understandably so. Uh, a guy like Rutan has power in every single strike, and everything he throws is uh, to go for the KO. He doesn't believe in, in, in throwing anything. 
without as, power. As we move along the fight, uh, Boss Ruin just coming at Funaki, backing him into a corner, throwing a kick, missing, but that right palm wow. strike connected. What a killer right Shote. Devastating Funaki. And blood coming out of Funaki's nose. And he gets up, he's ready to continue to uh, the pleasure of this crowd. That's gotta show heart because most, most fighters would have not even bothered to try and make that count after de getting delivered, after being on the receiving and end boss, of a blow like that. I'm not sure Jeez. if that was legal. Uh, Funaki was on the ground, another right palm strike. Boss Ruin perhaps smelling blood, literally. And Funaki does manage to get up, but he's got blood coming Look out of his nose. Look at his nose and his eye. The swelling starting to set in. It's gotta be hard for him to see right now. And, any momentum Funaki would have tried to initiate in this fight is, has really been taken aback by those heavy, heavy strikes from Boss Rutten. The doctor uh, checking Suzuki, uh, Funaki that is, making sure he's fit enough to continue this fight. Funaki though, uh, really the heart of a lion. He's not gonna quit and, and he knows what's on the line. Uh, he's gonna give it his all, whether it kills him, to get this belt. And both fighters will continue the fight. And Boss Rudin's trying to stay aggressive. Boss sensing that that KO may be just a punch away. And unleashing more palm strikes. And Funaki trapped in a corner. Funaki eating all oh. kinds of punishment. Big knee to the face from Rutan. And Funaki has to take this fight to the ground. Yeah, Rutan grabbing the ropes to avoid getting taken down and receiving a, ye uh, receiving a yellow card or a lost point, I believe. And look at, look at how hard Rudin is breathing. I'm not sure if I've ever seen him this tired in a Pancras match. And a light, light kick by uh, Funaki trying to start something here. A left high kick, but Funaki is still reeling from those blows. Rutan trying to land the Shote. Look, at, look out for the big knee from Rutan to and the I, face. And more palm strikes. Funaki trying to cover up to protect himself from those knees. Body shot from Funaki, but Rutan responds in kind with an uppercut and, and a left Shote. A vicious Shote at that, and Funaki down again, and he is getting up and continuing. I'm not believing what I'm seeing, Josh. Boss Rutan must be saying, what more can I do? I'm giving this guy everything I can handle, punches, kicks, but this guy just keeps coming back up. Funaki is refusing to quit. Or perhaps the ref would stop this match, but there is so much on the line, I think he's just gonna let Funaki uh, go as long as he can. Funaki now electing to trade blows with Rutan. Not a Got smart move. I think I saw no. his head snap back a little bit on that one. Big palm strikes from Rutan. Big right palm strikes. And the fight getting near the ropes. The ref will break them and restart. Uh, and it looks like actually no. Funaki uh, grabbed the ropes for the escape. And we just saw that happen to Bob Rutan not too long ago. And uh, they're going to have the doctors check on Funaki once more. Perhaps uh, wipe some of that blood. Funaki has to has to get out of this slugfest. He's got to put Rutan on his back. Uh, he's not going to be successful if he stays in front of Rutan like this. And Rutan's loving this break. Look how tired he is, Josh. He can't even stand in the corner. He's crouching down. Well, he's throwing everything he's got into every strike, and that is a very tiring thing to do, but it's been paying off in dividends for Rutan as he has absolutely devastated Funaki with his strikes. And Funaki trying to use the crowd to his advantage, but are Rutan having none of that? Once again, coming at Funaki, another knee left, palm strike, right palm strike. He is throwing everything he's got. Funaki refusing to go down under that barrage of deadly strikes. And I think we can see another knee oh. coming, and we do. Funaki taking a whole lot of punishment. Big knee to the chest. Still staying on his feet somehow. And a knee to the face puts Funaki down. And that is it. The referee says enough is enough. Funaki is KO'd by Boss Rudin, who retains his title. No easy victory. Look at Box. He is exhausted. He poured everything he had into every single strike he threw. And, you know, usually a person gets hit by one of those on the receiving end of Boss Rudin, and, and that's it. That's good night. But Funaki's will alone keeping him on his feet. Uh, what a what a devastating knockout, though. Just goes to show you the heart of Funaki. I mean, a lot of these Pancras fighters probably wouldn't have got up after the first knockdown, much less the uh, later knockdowns that Boss delivered. Hey, I know he likes to go by the nickname of El Guapo, but he's, I'd like to call him the knockout artist. And, but Boss Rudin, uh, definitely not an easy knockout, though. Uh, still very exhausted. Boss must have been very confused during that fight. Usually when he knocks an opponent down, he doesn't get up, but Funaki, like a rubber ball, just bouncing back up.
always. You gotta wonder if the boss is thinking, man, I, I hope this guy doesn't get up after this one because I'm my gas tank's about near empty. A uh, very good victory by boss win over Masakatsu Funaki, and Funaki has to be a little disappointed. He's the co-founder of Pancras, had his ch chance to become the Pancras champion, but he just fought a better guy today. And Josh, coming into this fight, it had a lot of hype. You're pitting two of the top contenders mm -hmm. in Pancras, and I think it lived up to its billing. Yeah, I'd agree so too. And, and unfortunately, one aspect is it didn't seem like Funaki fought a very intelligent fight considering the opponent he was going against. But to give credit where it's due, Boss just fought an amazing fight and really showing why the guy was undefeated for near two years in Pancras. All right. That does it for this week's show, but before we go, let's check out our highlight of the day. And that highlight comes from the Yuki Kondo against Frank Shamrock match. And as we see there, Shamrock getting knocked down to outside of the ring. What are we seeing here, Josh? A very nice kick, Shamrock just losing all balance. A couple of vicious left kicks to the head of Shamrock, sending him reeling outside the ring. and. Uh, falling hard, crashing <laughs> very dangerously to the outside of the ring and being unable to continue in that fight. A devastating knockout for uh, Yuki Kondo. All right, but before we go, Josh, I noticed at the end of our shows, you're giving a little hand gesture. Uh, what's the background story on that? Well, this basically stands for catch. And uh, this is what the referees will call, if you've been paying attention to some of the matches that, we, uh, that we've been showing you, uh, they will call the catch uh, anytime a, a wrestler gets caught into a submission and it looks like they're near being finished. So uh, basically, just kind of a staple of, of uh, pro wrestling and of Pancras here as the, the catch symbol. We got a hold of you and we're going to keep you here. All right, very good information. And that does it for this week's show. I'm Rob Wu. Josh Barnett. Join us next week. Same time, same place. Yeah.